medical emergencies are very common and the vast majority of them happen outside of hospitals. That means that the true first responder is someone without medical training, meaning somebody who's watching a game or is walking down the street or is at the movie that you're sitting in the movie theater. But most of these people are not prepared for these situations. It's hard to blame somebody who works in tech for not being ready to give someone CPR when they go into cardiac arrest in the middle of a movie that you're at. But it has been very well established at this point that the associated delays in care often lead to worse outcomes. People do poorly when they have an emergency and nobody helps them right away. So what do we do about that? We should do what we do best and find one of our friends who's an expert in saving lives and bring them on to teach you all the ways you can save a life. What do you think about that, Julie? I think that sounds fantastic. I think, yeah. you know, a little bit of training, give some some tips and, and tricks so that you can remember them. It's a great idea. Yeah. I mean, as, as a physician, the thing you fear the most is that airplane seat when somebody's like, is there a doctor on board? And you're like, I'm in the middle of a movie. Is that okay? <laughs> I don't fear it. I, I, I secretly am like, I hope they ask for a doctor. On this oh, wow. Well, I'm the complete opposite. So that's funny. I, I, I'm you like, have children please, though, too. It's a little different. No, yeah. I just don't want to have to. Um, <laughs> so we're going to cover obvious things like cardiac arrest. I think a lot of people, when they think of a car, uh, an emergency, they think of somebody's heart stopping and passing out, but we're also going to cover choking. I think that's another one that at least gets shown on TV shows and movies all the time, but really does have treatment. And then maybe some less discussed emergencies like stroke, which mm -hmm. certainly has had some more buzz around it, but often goes unrecognized and can be treated a lot better. So we're going to go over things like how do you recognize them? What should you do first? What should you not do? When to call the ambulance? And honestly, that's just the surface. We're going to really dive deep because we have an awesome expert today who honestly is so good at this that she has her own podcast where she goes through all of these fun situations. So yes. today on Your Doctor Friends, we're going to present the Every Person's Guide to What Should I Do in a Medical Emergency? Ready? Let's get it. I have really been looking forward to having this guest on the show. She is an expert in emergency medical care as a rapid response nurse. Even better, she is an expert in teaching others on how to recognize and respond to emergencies. You may know her as the Rapid Response RN on social media and the host of the Rapid Response RN podcast, where she teaches the ins and outs of rapid response care. Please welcome a friend of your doctor friends, Sarah Lorenzini. Sarah, thanks for joining us. Hey, hey, I'm happy to be here and talk about my favorite topic. Yes, this yeah. is an awesome episode. I'm really excited. I think Julie and I are going to learn stuff. Julie, did you cover codes when you were in, in residency? Did you guys have to go to like emergencies? Yeah, and not, not like you did all the time in the hospital, but uh, depending on the rotation, like when I worked in the ICU or when we worked on like the Hemonc floor and some other floors that we were the code team, but yeah, probably not as consistently as you did. Yeah, I was in an unopposed hospital where we were the only, that means we were the only residents in the hospital. So anytime there was an emergency, we ran the codes. And so I ran, by running code, what I mean is we're the ones that are <laughs> trying to save said person. And one of the things that I said is I the PTSD from that of the mm. click on intercom had took me years to get over, like whenever oh. an intercom would go off, even like at an airport where it would like click and somebody's going to tell you your gate has changed like I would get a sudden little drop in my heart because like I would have to usually that meant I was going through an emergency um yeah. so code blue uh, seven yes. tower code blue seven tower but yeah. luckily for that us impersonation. That's exactly how they sound. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to give Jeremy cold sweats <laughs> yeah yeah uh you luckily uh you and I don't do that much anymore Julie no. I mean we we're on the sidelines for things and bad stuff Different has stuff. happened but it's certainly not as regular so now we get to bring on somebody else to teach us all so as they say, when there is a burning building, most people run away, but first responders run in. Yeah. When shit is hitting the fan in the hospital, Sarah, you are running to be the first one there and you're yep. like proud and excited and happy about it. So tell us your story. Why do you like to be in the fire? Oh my gosh. That's a really good question. <laughs> you know, I actually went to nursing school with the intention of being a midwife because I just think birth and babies is the coolest thing ever. But I got a job as a nurse tech in the ER just to get experience. And I fell in love with taking care of patients and families in crisis. So I'm not your typical like adrenaline junkie that goes skydiving in my free time. Not at all. Like I'm a mom of five kids and I crochet for fun and drive a minivan. But I really love being there for people on the worst day of their life. And so I spent years working as an ER nurse 
and then cardiac ICU. And then I found out about this position of rapid response nursing. And I was like, oh, literally all day long running to people who are having the worst day of their life. That is the, the dream job for me. I've learned some tips and techniques to kind of stay calm um, when everything around you is crashing. <laughs> so it really is a, a perfect job for the way that I'm wired and for what I love to do. So that's how I ended up doing this. <laughs> that's awesome. I, uh, badass nurses are the absolute best. And I feel like doctors get a lot of undue credit <laughs> that we certainly do not deserve. And I certainly <laughs> feel like in, in the instances where mainly when I was working in the hospital, I, it was the nurses that were working with me to be like, okay, you should do this next, you know, and like kind of <laughs> your origin story makes me think of Jen Hamilton, the, who's an amazing nurse and her uh, thing online that she says that just makes me almost cry every time is that when she is with a, a patient who's really having a really difficult time and is really scared and is really freaked out and she does labor and delivery, um, mm -hmm. she always says to them, and it's been kind of like a viral thing that she talks about is, um, I know you're scared, but I'm not. And like, mm -hmm. that just like gives me bleh, chills every time. And I just think of, I think of you too, Sarah. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah. So in addition to your day job as that badass rapid response nurse that Julie was yeah. referencing, you've dedicated a lot of your time to educating others on responding to emergencies. You have the podcast, you have a course that you teach people, you do it on a daily basis at your day job. Medical emergencies are kind of your thing and medical emergencies for every person level one is what we've asked you to come on and teach everybody. So where should we start? I think we should start with what to do if you see someone collapse in front of you. Cause that's like the, everyone's fear. Yeah. Oh my gosh, do I have to do mouth to mouth to this stranger? So yeah. I'd love to dive into that. <laughs> I love that. Let's, let's start right there. Somebody just collapsed. What, what should somebody do? Sure thing. So first thing is go assess them. Hello, sir. Are you okay? Are you okay? Like tap them on the shoulder, on the chest, see if they respond to you. And then if they don't, there's checking a pulse. I would say you could also start yelling, can someone please call 911? Yeah. They say it's best to actually look someone in the eyes and point at them directly and say, you with the blue shirt, call 911. You just say, can someone call 911? Everyone assumes someone else is doing it and then yeah. maybe it never gets done. So point at someone. And then checking for a pulse just involves feeling someone's neck and feeling if there's a pulse. And if you don't feel anything in just a couple seconds, it's time to start compressions. Worst case scenario, they don't need compressions and you do two of them and they come off, they're like, stop, stop. <laughs> great, that's great, that's a great response. <laughs> but if they need compressions, you don't wanna spend forever looking for a pulse because that whole time the heart is not actually squeezing. So the whole goal of doing CPR to someone who is pulseless is to actually generate a pulse, to actually squeeze the heart for them from the outside. Now, a CPR course, that's like a four hour course. I cannot teach you CPR in the audio format of a podcast in the yeah. next 30 minutes. <laughs> right. But I would highly recommend if you have not taken a CPR course to go take one. They're like 30 bucks. And then you can know what to do to save someone that might, you know, maybe your loved one <laughs> that collapses in front of you. Yeah. So CPR um, in the hospital setting, we are compressing on the chest and also providing breasts. We have a device like a mask that fits around the face that can deliver breasts to the patient. And outside of the hospital, they used to teach um, compressions and then mouth to mouth resuscitation. But the American Heart Association said, you know what? A lot of people are not into that. Um, and so pe people are not getting CPR because no one wants to do mouth to mouth. So years ago, they actually switched it to outside of the hospital, hands only CPR is excellent. That's an mm -hmm. excellent way to get someone to save someone's life. Obviously providing breath is a little bit better, but the benefit is minuscule. When you think about the risk of someone not doing it at all, if they're mm -hmm. afraid of doing the breast part. So hands only CPR is literally just crouching over the patient, locking your elbows out, putting all your body weight into that person's chest, like interlace your fingers to put them right in the center between the nipples and just press hard and fast. Um, I've been a nurse for 20 years. And I still sing in my head, uh, 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 staying alive, staying alive, uh, uh, because that's the perfect pace to achieve a hundred to 120 compressions per minute. So if you're yeah. kind of moving to the beat of that song, you are nailing it with regards to how fast to go CPR. Is there maybe another people's... song that we could, we could use? I feel like I saw it on your social media recently. It should be like a Gen Z song because like, I feel like they, we're going to be not cool anymore with these. They're like, I don't know what that song well, is. Well, another one bites the dust is also the same one, but I don't like that one. It's not quite as inspirational. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> and then there's a couple Taylor Swift songs that fit that 
category. In Ooh. fact, if you go to Spotify, there's a whole Spotify playlist for CPR. Now and we're every talking. One of those songs has the appropriate like metronome <laughs> based out. Oh my you. god! But staying alive, everyone knows that song. Um, yeah. That's that's what I've been singing for all these years. So anyway, so pressing CPR hard too. And- you found it. Okay, good. Yes, <laughs> a lot of good ones. So uh, just pressing- dance, it'll be okay. Oh, there we go. <laughs> just dance, spin that record, babe. Yep. Yeah, it really gets you in the mood for some CPR dancing. There's- Statistically, for every minute that bystander CPR is not provided, that decreases someone's chance of survival by 10%. Wow. So if we're all sitting around standing at this person who has no pulse for 10 minutes, their chance of survival is next to nothing. But for patients that have had bystander CPR, even subpar CPR, their chance of survival is so much greater. And, you know, working in the ER, we'd get report from EMS and they would say, this patient's been down for X amount of minutes, but they had bystander CPR from the beginning. And all of us are like, okay, good. We might actually get them back. But if they say this patient's been down at the mall for 10 minutes with no bystander CPR, all of us in our heads are thinking this is not gonna, gonna go very well. But I have seen people who have made a full recovery after having 30 minutes, 40 minutes of CPR, and somehow they still come back because even though technically they are dead, we are circulating the blood for them through doing high quality CPR. So CPR is important. Uh, The other piece is knowing how to use an AED. Like I feel Mm -hmm. like when I started my career, it was this rare thing like, oh, look at that. The grocery store has an AED, but now Mm -hmm. everywhere has AEDs. Um, there's even apps that will tell you where the AEDs are located in your community with like little photos of where they're located on the wall. So, I mean, the gym, the grocery store, the library, like any government building everywhere has AEDs. They're super easy to use. Um, for a lot of people, the reason why they collapse is for the, from an arrhythmia. And if we can get the AED on them, we can actually shock them out of that rhythm and, and get them back. So early defibrillation is good for patient outcomes as well. But again, an AED is scary unless you've used them before, but if you take a CPR class, you will get to practice with the AED and feel more comfortable with it because they really did kind of make it foolproof. You put the pads on and you hit analyze, and then it tells you to press the shock button or not. So pretty good. Well, and I think some of the people listening may be having that image in their head of like those paddles going on in some sort of like TV show and, and, and From doing 1980? that. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. If you open up the new ones there, the instructions are written for like a, 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 five-year-old like my yeah. it, it, it it's stickers that literally tell you on what part of the body in a picture to put on the patient and you push the button and it literally reads it for you and says either shock advised or shock not advised yeah it couldn't be easier and so i just think everything you've set up to this point is so empowering for everybody listening who does not have medical training but could save a life because you just said Doing even subpar CPR, getting your hands on them and pushing is going to give them a better chance. And then putting an AED on, which on the surface may sound scary, but is not, can really save their life. So I just so empowering for people who are not medically trained to get into the fire. If somebody has cardiac Collapse. arrest or passes yeah. out, collapses to, to be there and you can you can be a huge part of, of saving somebody's life. One one question I, I thought of just logistically about putting an AED pads on someone. I don't know if you guys have thought of this too, but like, do you have to take, should you be taking someone's shirt off? And if so, like, do you have to take their bra off? Like, I don't know. I've never had to These put are great AED. Questions. Right. And, the, and I, th- I think some people might think of like, oh, decorum, but it's like, if you don't do this, this person might die. So yeah, I think <laughs> they're okay crap. with showing yeah. a little skin if it saves your life. Right. Totally. Yeah. So the pads, they can go um, on the sides of the person. Mm-hmm. So it would go like over her, um, right chest, but above the breast and then uh-huh. right below her left breast. So there's no actually breast hanging out. Sure. They can still have a bra on and you can get the AD pads on them appropriately. Yeah. Um, the real challenge is a, a hairy, hairy person, folks. Yes. hairy folks can make it difficult to get pad contact. Mm-hmm. So most AEDs come with two sets of pads. So you can put the first one on, wax the other hairs off, and then put the second set of pads on. But that's a whole other, <laughs> whole other discussion. <laughs> well, and like, how would you know? Would you be trying to put the pads on, and it would just be like, yeah, if it's not, not sticking, functioning, wax yeah. them and start again with the next set of pads. Right. But those those pads are very sticky. Like, I don't know what those are made out of, but they could be doing some some really high end wax jobs. They're really really sticky material. She also said, wax them just like so fluently <laughs> that she's clearly done that before. <laughs> yeah. Many, many times, actually. (laughs) 
well, I mean, this is the stuff you don't think about. And all of a sudden you're like, do I have to, is this, do you have to cut someone's shirt off? Like, what if they are hairy? Like, is that, what if they're sitting in water? There's logistic stuff that this, the things that you don't think about, and then you're already panicking. You're like, is this bad? Like, so I think it's good to walk through these scenarios. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Pull them out of water. To yeah, f- don't be, pull them don't out of water before you defibrillate. Before yeah. you shock them. That's awesome. 